Thank you for downloading the Start the Week podcast from BBC Radio 4. For more information, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. Hello. Well, these are hard economic times for Britain, but the country is apparently still proud of its design and creativity. Indeed, a new survey exciting some newspapers today suggests that, partly thanks to that, Britain is a world leader in soft power. Well, if this country has been a hub for creative work, then art colleges are among the reason why. Unusually open, mildly anarchic gardens for young designers and artists. The Royal College of Art celebrates its 175th anniversary this week with an exhibition, and I'm joined by some famous alumni and teachers from the art college world, the sculptor Anthony Gormley, the designer Ron Arad, the design historian Sarah Teasley, and a former rector of the Royal College itself, Sir Christopher Frayling. Christopher, you wrote a history of the Royal College, and one of the things that fascinated me is the parallels between the official anxieties that led to this being founded way back in 1837 and what's going on today. Yeah, there was a select committee looking at our manufacturers and our exports and our balance of payments, rings a slight bell, Mm -hmm. and they looked at Lyon silk, at uh, French silk and wallpaper, and then they went off to Prussia and Bavaria to look at industrial design, and they came back and said, what can we do to improve the quality of design for manufacture? They also said, why is there this snobbery about sort of applied subjects. Why are universities so snobbish about people who use their hands? And why are we sort of so good at luxury goods and not so good at mass manufacture goods? It rings a slight it bell. It really rings, it rings so many bells. And, and so they set up the Government School of Design, which is the origin of public sector art education in this country. And it was only within two years of any public sector education of any sort. So it was obviously a priority. And to start with, it wasn't terribly successful. Indeed, there was. A, I was delighted to see there was a student revolt almost immediately. There was. It was one one of the first sit-ins in the history of British higher education, 1845, uh, because they wanted life drawing. In 1837, they knew what they didn't want. They didn't want to turn all these hapless students into artists, so they weren't allowed to do life drawing, they weren't allowed to compete with the Royal Academy. Um, they had to do... They had to sit there and copy geometric shapes and copy antique things, and, and if they were very, very grown up, they might even be allowed to do a drawing of their own, but probably not. And the students got upset, so by 1845 they had a sit-in saying, we want to do life drawing. Take the drape off the life model. We mm. actually want a life model who's nude. Questions in the House and fine <laughs> art was introduced to public sector art education as a result of student agitation. And then later on uh, the Royal College moves to what's been called Albertopolis, um, the, the, the Albert Hall, Albert Monument sprawl of South Kensington, where it is still today. Yeah, everyone talks about you know the legacy of the Olympics, but talk about legacy. The legacy of the 1851 Great Exhibition. All those museums down at what became Exhibition Road, all those colleges, Royal College of Art, Royal College of Music, Imperial College of Science Technology, and now Medicine, and etc., etc. And all of that is on the back of the profits of the Great Exhibition. So the Royal College moves to South Ken, and indeed the system of teaching design gets known as the South Kensington system all over the world. Absolutely. And, and if we fast forward right to the, the current day, this is uh, the Royal College is for uh, graduates, it's for people studying MA. Um, and it, it, it brings together people studying textile design, vehicle design, engineering, and some people who want, in the end, to be fine artists. Yes, it's, uh, it's about 50-50 between Mm. uh, the fine and applied arts and design. And the whole philosophy is really there's a two-way street between them, that uh, you you study art in a design environment and design in an art environment. Entirely postgraduate, average age of the students, 23, 24, 25, Mm. um, and very specialised these days. In Victorian times, you did design, which was basically drawing and copying things. Now, as you say, you do vehicle design, graphic design, fashion Mm. design, textile design. So it's all very specialised, very face-to-face. And one of the important things is that practitioners should teach you Mm. not career academics but people who actually have one foot in the world of practice and that's very important moving uh, just a little bit away from the rta itself um i I was fascinated sort of writing about um british history in the 20th century what a huge number of creative people particularly in things like rock music and so on had come out of british art colleges the art college movement you know beyond the royal college and beyond london has been hugely influential on the life of this country hasn't it, it has and what i never understand is uh, you know there's so many column inches devoted to financial services all the time now financial services contributes to gdp about 1% more than 
the creative industries, which employ 2 million people, whereas the financial services employ 1 million people. So in terms of contribution to the economy, generally, the creative industries actually have it over financial services in almost every way. And how many column inches are there about it? Very little. Mm. So you're quite right, this huge impact, but people don't seem to be noticing. Anthony Gormley was nodding there. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, that extraordinary burst of creativity of the 60s, in music particularly, couldn't have happened without art schools. I mean, if you think of uh, kind of Brian Ferry, if you think of David Bowie, I mean, all of them came out of the liberal art college education Mm. where uh, anarchy was the, the idiom. There's almost not a, ba- a famous band which isn't out of an art college, or some of whose members aren't out of an art college from that period. Actually, absolutely, and yeah. I think that I, mean, I think that underlines the, the 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 culture that there was this sense that actually making a future doesn't come out of uh, doing things well that have already been done, but trying new things, and that's what was really encouraged in art school. Mm. Uh, Ron Arad, you actually were, were teaching at the Royal College. Uh, for- Can you just reflect a little bit on the tension, if there is a tension, between the old skills um, or the traditionalist skills of the fine art students sitting there and um, engineering and design um, and the danger of separating those things? Um, Yes, uh, I took, I was, I found myself at the college. I didn't plan an academic career. I didn't want to teach at the college, but... I was asked, and I said, "Okay." And I, I had to yeah. you were and, along. I, and I, I inherited a course that's called furniture, not even furniture design, which means teaching people how to dovetail and how to make wooden things. Mm-hmm. And there was the industrial design course that was about how to skin hair dryers, and uh, at that time, and I said, "Okay, we'll we'll do it," and then. To my surprise, everything I wanted to do, Christopher said, yes, okay. Mm. Why don't we join the two courses together? Why should, which is the opposite of what you talked about before, which is specializing. Mm. I'm against specializing. I'm against creating a course that teaches one thing or that it's about one trend or one sort of manifesto, one look. So, I mean, very much I copied the AA where I studied, which was a very pluralist place you had lots of contradictory things side by side mm. and it was all about choice we could never tell if, if Alvin Boyarsky that was the, the chairman was totally indifferent to everything or a real pluralist <laughs> uh, so that's that's what I thought so, it, I, uh, I, so, so, so the atmosphere the, 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 the balance of having discipline and actual teaching versus a sense of possibilities and people running from one discipline to another, crossing boundaries, is, is, is crucial. Well, I didn't like the word boundaries. I didn't like all the discussions about breaking the boundaries and because uh, the more you talk about them, the more you reinforce them. And yeah. there's a lot of talk about, about interdepartmental projects and things. It doesn't happen. The only time you see the other departments is when there's a fire alarm. And everyone finds themselves outside. Ah, you work here too. That's a bit unfair, but anyway. No, it yeah. is a bit. It is a bit. It is a bit unfair. But it is such a. It used yeah. to be. A but long you created Ron, with your design products course a kind of mini college in a way within your. You know, you got furniture at one end of the spectrum, and lots of gestural creative design at the other. So in a way, you created a little unit that was a microcosm of the whole college. Yeah, I, th- I thought the most important thing in in designing a course is choosing. The Choosing teachers going to be on it. Yeah. It was going to be first of all that the teachers, uh, and then you know we had to to choose people from opposing uh, directions. People you know like people that are very close to what I do. People that are completely on the other side. That's one thing. The other thing is choosing the students because this college is very much in demand and there's has a very good name and it's very prestigious and lots of people from foreign countries. Mm-hmm. I want. I, I definitely want to return to that point. I just want but, to but bring, just, just, yeah, on, just sure. on the issue of, of appointing professors. I mean, one of the one of the tricks I thought was to bring in 
eminent practitioners and try and create a situation where they're protected from all the admin and desk work and committee work that submerges so many people in higher education. So, you know, in comes Ron, and then you appoint some number twos who are the sort of engine room of the department, so Ron can spend his whole time teaching. And that's incredibly important for the culture of art that schools and a community very, very of rare. practitioners. It has to be said that that's what's, that's what's under threat um, in the S- way that all Sarah, the Sarah Teasley. I was in, in response both to Ron and Christopher and Anthony to what you've just said as well. Um, I think, I mean, one thing that comes out at the college when it's running well, and presumably at any art school, there's a sense that the tutors and the technicians and the students are in it together. Um, I think we sometimes describe it as a laboratory where everyone is experimenting and thinking and challenging together in the same place. And so what you're saying about practitioners who are in the, who are in the world of design and art working alongside the students, there's a bit of mentoring, but there's also a sense in which the, tu- the students, everyone is a professional together. But there but it has to be also that sense that actually your agenda setting, you are actually mm-hmm. at the wave, and that wave is being seen, as it were, by the whole world. And I think that, that, that sense of... Um, well, I, th- I, think, I think Ron is, is unique. I think that he created at the, at the Royal College a complete mixture. I mean, I, I always used to say that design was there to make the, 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 the life of the world easier, and art was there to make it more interesting and more difficult. And I think that Ron never accepted that dichotomy <laughs> and always wanted to make designs that made it more interesting and more difficult. I'd like to ask a little bit about the, the mood um, for the students, the atmosphere, because, Sarah, you write, uh, you've written one of the essays in, in the book looking at 175 years, um, uh, part of the exhibition, and you use very interesting word, besottedness, which you pick up from a rather peppery-looking former director <laughs> of the RCA, Robin Darwin, um, after the war, who said that students come to us because they are truly besotted in their work. Mm -hmm. So thank you for picking up on my favourite word in the essay. Um, I was determined to get it in wherever I could. The um, former rector of the college, Robin Darwin, um, has a wonderful quote where he says, students come to the college because they're truly besotted. And then he goes on to say, but do you know what? This is actually a universal ideal. So in a way, they're both being selfish in pursuing their dreams and they're doing something that's truly beyond them and contributing to society and the world. And I think it's a wonderful quote to describe the way that art schools work. You need to be besotted. We'd not be there if we weren't. I mean, it's not the financial sector. We're not brilliantly paid. But we're there because every day you go home, and if it's a good school, you go home saying, good heavens, I, my mind is completely exploding But right going now. home is interesting, because the only student trouble I had when I was rector was a little uh, demonstration, could we stay open after 11 o'clock at night, please? Mm. We want to stay in the studio. Complete obsession and commitment with the work, which I'd never, never encountered in the university sector. Well, I went to the drawing school um, uh, a little while ago, and there, relatively late in the evening, there was one dogged student refusing <laughs> to leave because he was working so hard. Um, Anthony Gormley, I mean, you went to uh, various art colleges, not this one, as a student. Mm. Um, that that sense of besottedness, the sense of... You talk to quite a lot of people that going to art school was the most exciting time of life of all. Did you, did you find that, or were you disappointed? Absolutely. No, I, I, I started at the Central, and I found that over-administered and actually rather boring. I, I, I just remember that very first um, yeah, course, um, the first term. We were locked into a room. There were two white gloves. If you had a glove, you could, wor- you could work. If you didn't, uh, you had to watch. I mean, it was a, the most ghastly, skinnerist kind of behaviourist experiment. Anyway, I didn't last there, and then I went to Goldsmiths. And at Goldsmiths, there was this absolute understanding that everybody there was besotted, but anyway, absolutely compelled by an inner demon to keep going and keep exploring and keep actually articulating what they were exploring, either by showing it or by talking about it. And in fact, the whole thing was really driven by the students. There was an understanding that the major Energy and the thing that you, the, 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 the source from which you learn most was the energy of your fellow students. And that was, in a way, the motivating, the motivating factor. And I think what Ron has just said that the most important thing is the constitution of the course. What, what, what the, the, the tutors can, as it were, provoke in the students, but then how you constitute in your, in, in your interviewing process a, a kind of chemistry in every year. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's, um, then it's a self-motivating principle. Christopher, for all those people listening 
who are thinking, well, that sounds a lot of fun. I'm, I'm sure it's very pleasant, but how can you possibly uh, tabulate or enumerate the, 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 the value of these places in, in, in hard times? You know, we need more engineers. We understand we need more people working with uh, uh, reinforced concrete to build us bridges and this and that. Um, what, what do you say to them? Just, just, just remind people what the value of art colleges has brought to this country. In, in uh, economic terms... Um, the great debate since the 90s has been about the creative industries, this sector of the economy, which is art, design, broadcasting, publishing, etc., right across the spectrum. And art schools have had, as we've heard, have had a crucial impact on the whole creative sector in the UK. It's something we're very good at. In fact, the Treasury has predicted that by 2017, about 50% of new jobs in the UK will be coming from the creative sector. Okay? That, seem, that seems almost incredible. I have Not really. Say. We're very, very good at it. Um, the problem has been that people say, we'll write it, they'll print it. Right. Mm. So we do all the ideas, we generate all the design ideas, and someone in China is going to do the manufacturing. D D Dyson creates his designs for, for, for new cleaners, and they're made elsewhere because they have to be still. Yeah, and, and that was a disaster in many ways, because it, it, sort of, uh, it meant that design became this sort of abstracted thing that you do. You do all the think work in England, but the do work is somewhere else, and someone's got to try and bring those two elements of the equation together. But there's the creative sector is one aspect of it. There's, there's the sideways step that students take. You know, they don't all end up as professional artists that in advertising in broadcasting right across the spectrum you get people who who've learnt to art at art school but they've also learnt through art various skills for life that art seems to be very very good at instilling and they take a sideways step and do other things to say that, that art college is not about being good for the economy um, Absolutely. I, no, and I wasn't used, saying that. I was answering you know, I was, Andrew's I, I, point. I, I, I was college. provoking that. I <laughs> used to scare Christopher when I said, yes. we take perfectly employable people, two years, and they're unemployable. I know, he'd say that just <laughs> as I was bringing a government minister around. No, you know, I, oh, I, I think we mustn't get lost in this debate, because I think that a good <laughs> liberal arts, uh, art student life is a, a, a instrument for thinking. I mean, uh, allows you to um, uh, yeah, think by doing in a way that no no other education can. And I think that it also gives you the context if there are uh, you know, v very good theoretical courses that run by, by the side of the doing, uh, a way of being circumspect about the kind of world that, uh, that you're living in. And yet you can't get away from the fact that around the world, uh, Anthony Gormley's um, and Anish Kapoor's and Ron Arad's uh, chairs and spectacles and, 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 and bicycles are things by which Britain is now known, probably better known than any kind of cars or big companies, and that must have some effect on the way the country's perceived. Well, it's your soft power point again. I mean, it's art schools have been key whether, with that as well. Whether soft power includes any kind of power, I don't know, but Yes, I think there has to be an outcome, but I, I don't National like prestige. the idea. I don't like the idea that somehow you know uh, you 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 quantify the the use of an art <laughs> college um, by how many uh, you know places in industry um, you're you're providing. It's absolutely not the point, mm. Sarah. I mean, on that on that point, I think there is the question about how does art college justify itself to the rest of the world will never go away. Um, that gives us a useful opportunity to continue. This is something that I argue in my essay. It gives us an opportunity to continue redefining ourselves to continue advocating. And particularly now, when arts funding and humanities funding um, from entire, uh, the entire spectre of not just higher education, but primary and on up, is in danger. Um, when government funding to humanities teaching has been essentially cut, um, and teachers in primary school, secondary schools are finding music, arts, drama outside the new EBAC that's being proposed, because we've got these challenges and because we're being asked to justify ourselves, it gives us the chance to make noise. Yeah, well, this is very interesting because here we are talking about how wonderful art colleges are and, and how important they've been to Britain just at the time when art and design has been specifically yeah. mm -hmm. excluded from the new curriculum. Yeah, more than that. It's, uh, you know, the Brown Review of Higher Education, which was the basis for the restructuring and the fees and all these other things, actually has a paragraph where it says there are certain priority subjects in the national interest which will get special treatment science, technology, engineering, mathematics and a bit of Chinese language and, uh, and some healthcare 
if only he'd mentioned design, that whole debate since the 1990s, I thought, had been won, mm, which I was actually the importance of these creative subjects to the national interest. And I completely accept what Ron's saying. It's not the justification for art schools, but it's a very, very useful pragmatic argument. Then the Russell Group of universities say they're no longer going to accept art and design GCSEs as a prerequisite for getting in. Then you get the baccalaureate saying we're not going to have the arts as part of the core. I really don't understand it. I thought the argument was won in the 90s. It slipped incredibly in the last five years. And I went to a dinner, actually, and sat next to Lord Brown and said, why on earth did you not mention design in that famous paragraph about priority subjects? He said, what a good idea. What are we going to do about it? Well, I mean, the horse has bolted, I'm afraid, and it's very, very sad that those net gains that we all thought we'd made seem to have slipped. And I, economically, this is disastrous. So as compared to 1837, um, we're not nearly as forward-looking. Well, I think something that Britain is in a very interesting place. And once again, we, all, we know that Britain was the leader in, in industrialisation. Um, talking about the Industrial Revolution, Britain was there first. And since 1837, successive governments in Japan, in Korea, in China, um, in the North America as well, have said, how do we improve our manufacturing and our exports through art and design? What we've now got in Britain, and I think it's probably the first anywhere in the world, is the flip. And it's what, um, what Andrew, you and Christopher were talking about earlier. Now we need to say, how do we bring the making side back as well and have something underneath mm. the creative industries? Mm. Um, Anthony, you, I mean, you fabricate, you make, you have people yeah. working with you. You're this is a, this is a real a kind of subject of passion for me. I think, I think it's absolutely essential that uh, there is a continuity between design and making. And I, I, I try and make the majority of my work here. Uh, but I work with, for example, a foundry in Halifax, Yorkshire. Halifax uh, in the 60s had 52 foundries. There are now three. Um, and actually, it's... Th if we don't keep them going, we're really going to be screwed. And I think the, 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 fact, the fact is, I, I was very sad when Dyson decided that all of, its, all, all of his production was going to go to, to Singapore. Because it is the link-up that Christopher was saying about, in a way, um, doing, doing the drawing and then having the things made that needs a continuity. And that's the very thing that could, could reinforce our manufacturing. Mm. Mm. And, Ron, and, sorry, and, just bring in Ron Arad here. Because side of it is lots of design students graduate and they're very grateful to places like Italy that can employ them and use their talent where there's very little going on here. When it comes to some of your um, more commercial uh, work, uh, I mean, is, is that made here or is that mostly made outside the UK? It's greatly made in Italy, mm -hmm. where they have an amazing tradition of, of artisans. Of craftsmanship. That, craftsmanship yeah. and artisans that you don't have here. Very sad to see that a lot of them are being replaced by CNC machines, but that's the way it goes and we enjoy that as well. Um, yeah, I mean, most of the stuff is not made here. And, and, and when you're working here, you, have a, a, you keep your team pretty tight, I think, in terms of the number of people working with you, the number of designers working with you. Um, uh, do, do they then go off, some of them, and create practices of their own? Is there a sort of seeding of... Um... Don't give them ideas. <laughs> they... but, but, Ron, I mean, um... to, get, to get back to this, you know, Italy does it better than us and you, they, they, they've got, as it were, the, they, the tooling to do it. Why can't that be true of Britain? Uh, I don't know. It's, it can be, but why, why it doesn't happen, I don't know. But in Italy, it does happen, you know. Lots, uh, lots of small companies working together over generations who've stuck with it may be part mm. of the answer. I, 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 I can give you sorry, one, other, one other thing that would help manufacturing come back. This is actually precisely what I'm researching at the moment, mm -hmm. is how can small and medium-scale manufacturing, especially in further-flung regions, be brought back and how can it be regenerated? And I've spent a lot of time talking to SMEs, talking to people on the shop floor, and one of the things that comes up repeatedly that we're not doing in this country, and I say we because I am in art and design education here, is really pushing regional innovation through research and through connections between research institutes and regions and manufacturers. Some universities are doing a fabulous job, but the one thing that comes up over and over again when I'm talking to SMEs is the fact that they've got researchers, including designers, outside um, who've not got to think about short-term profits with whom they're able to share ideas and with whom they're able to develop. Mm. Well, I uh, certainly, in, in, 
in building the Angel of the North, this was a totally linked up project between the, the parametrics department, the engineering department, the newly, uh, the newly founded um, virtual um, uh, development department of Sunderland University. And with all of those working together, we got back the shipbuilders that could make the bow bulges to make its bum and make its head. You know, yeah. how, how do you turn uh, six and a half millimeter ship plate into a compound curve well you do it by spraying it with ice cold water and at the same time heating it with an oxyacetylene um, flame it's a it's like playing a violin it's a skill mm -hmm. but we found those skills back and what did we do we ended up making this thing that in some way was both a an extreme like uh, you know um, act of confidence in this community's future it was a way of we couldn't have designed it but, without. But also, possibly a new farewell flourish too. as well to a lot of this, the, the fabrication of that part of the world. Yes, I know. Well, I think that what's happened with with the Swan Hunters is that those skills have have had to find mm. uh, n new outlets, but they're still there. And my, I mean, my my, with a new idea of what to do with them, they can flourish. Mm -hmm. And that's my point yeah. that we don't have to say we can export it all, all that industry elsewhere. Mm. Uh, elsewhere. Christopher Freeling. And uh, others have certainly got this message. I, I, I gave a lecture a couple of years ago in Hong Kong about um, art schools in Britain and what they contribute. And I asked the Design Council how many design colleges there were in mainland China. And they said they thought 800, either growing out of engineering colleges or freestanding. So I said in the lecture, I gather there are eight... Statistics are really difficult with China. Uh, I gather there are 800 uh, design colleges. Someone said, excuse me, sir, 1,200. 1,200 design colleges in mainland China linked with small artisanal making and with manufacturing. They've certainly got the message... The message they hadn't got, we had a fascinating discussion. They said, well, what sort of students do you get? And I said, well, they're bloody-minded, they're bolshy, they're angry, <laughs> they love pushing the envelope. That's mm. where you get an avant-garde from. That's where ideas come from. It's sort of Ron's point. Uh, not in China. Uh, we don't do that. Uh, we, we stand on the shoulders of the master. And uh, so that's interesting, whether a sort of Confucian philosophy of education is possible in an art school. But they've certainly got the message. And the other message they've got, which I think relates to manufacturing, is how do you link art schools with science? Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, if you take the Royal College, up the road is Imperial College. And Robert Winston, with whom I'm often confused, once said... Uh, yeah, it's a moustache. Thank you very much. And the voice slightly. Um, for every idea that comes out of a lab in Imperial College... That could be partnered with a young designer at the Royal College sure. a few yards away to turn it into a desirable product. That's not quite happening. The science world yeah. and, the, and the art school world, that's very important to all our futures, I think. Ron Arad. Yeah. A good example for what you're saying is, uh, I don't know if you remember, Jorge Lopez. Yes, yes. Who you better did, explain. He is he's a, he's a Brazilian uh, student. He did a PhD in the course, and he, he researched making. He researched model making. He ended up developing uh, a way to do 3D prints of uh, embryos through ultrasound. And he's sort of a leading, he's an art student, and he invented an amazing mm -hmm. medical tool. But the, I mean, the Royal College's uh, designers come up with things like um, new forms of ambulance and hospital beds and, and all sorts of absolutely day-to-day -day gritty kinds of design, don't they, Sarah? Indeed. Um, I think, and this is a point that, um, thinking about where should art schools in general be going, um, if you're, students, it's partly about this sort of mad bullshiness, but I think it's about this collision of mad bullshiness and I'm going to challenge what you say and I'm going to challenge you as well with a pragmatic engagement with communities. And that may be the elderly. Um, at the Royal College, we have um, what's the, the uh, Helen Hamlin Centre, which is pretty much, I would say, Christopher, the world leader in research designed for ageing. Um, and we have, a number, we have an intake of young student researchers or postgraduate um, researchers every year. And some of the projects that come out are, for example, redesigning the NHS ambulance. Mm. Um, something I'd mention, though, about design and science, um, I'd like to bring Fight Art in as well. And um, Ron, you have just now, and mention that we are starting to also see um, the students clamouring for more work with science, particularly because areas like nanotech, um, like biology, are starting to look increasingly like design, instead, especially when you get into something like synthetic biology. They, they, Sorry, I'd like to bring in uh, Anthony Gormley. Just uh, here. Yeah, I think, I mean, for me, the, the, the thing now is to say we have, we have this 
uh, extraordinary history of manufacturing. We have to now link it, I think, with, with, with the new technologies that allow us to design, you know, uh, well, I, we use Rhino, for instance, in the studio the whole time. Rhino, 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 Rhino is a software program that I'm allows relief. I thought, I thought, I thought that's <laughs> very, Rhino very is a yeah. drug. You thought no. <laughs> exactly. Um, no, it's, it's 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 a thing that allows you to design in three dimensions. Linking that skill then with a, um, a sand casting operation in Hexham, for example, we're able to do things that they would never have dreamed of doing, but we can do them in a way that uses very, very ancient techniques. And I think that's what, that's what you know, good art colleges do. Let's they not make links. About delight that art can give mm. people. Delight and, and in culture is anyway surplus to requirement. You know, when we, when we are hungry, we eat whatever we can. When we are not hungry, we start putting spices in it, mm. and we enjoy it. And I think it's very easy to get. Yes, nobody, n nobody bought your, your your Rover chair because they needed a chair. Um, they bought it because it made them laugh. It was comfortable. It was amusing. It was beautiful. It's all all of the above. I mean, she said the, the, firmly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Christopher, I, uh, you mentioned the the Helen Hamlin Centre. That was very interesting because I think the Art School of the Future does need to change its mindset a bit. With that one, we wanted to set up. I think it's one of, one of the most important things I did actually. We wanted to set up a centre for design for an ageing population. Right? The demographics changing, and you know, Twiggy appears on M and S posters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, uh, and the mindset of most of the students were, it's really naff to design for older people. I want to design for my peer group. I understand what a 23-year-old, what's in the ether for a 23-year-old, and I want to design for youth. And there was a huge youth orientation towards most for graphics, fashion, textiles, etc. Mm. And we had to get them off that and say, it's actually OK to design for granny. Because actually, granny is in the post-mortgage, post-children generation who's got lots of money, and demographically, they're going to be the consumers mm. of the future. Some and of them slowly, do some of them it don't, moved but around. Yeah, yeah but yeah. slowly, it moved around to uh, designing for an aging population, and, and I think it was that's one mindset that has to change. I S think within Sarah. our schools. I wanted to ask Christopher a bit about um, industrial partnerships within Helen Hamlin, partly to shift the conversation to talk about what industry might be doing. We've been talking about what art schools need to do. We've talked a bit about government. Um, one of the things that we talk about in the college particularly is working with industry, um, collaborations mm -hmm. that let students learn, but also let students give something to the economy, to say something that Ron is not going to like. Um, and I also know, I mean, we also know that it's very, it's relevant, it's relatively easy for a school like the Royal College or Central St. Martins that are in London to get very interesting um, corporate sort of sponsor, not sponsorships, partnerships. partnerships yeah. But um, I was talking with someone recently but said, hang on, shouldn't all art schools be doing that? Shouldn't they all have the chance? Um, and we know that funding in most areas comes to the mm. terms of the capital, not to regions. Well, I think your point about regional development comes in there. There are mm -hmm. certain industries... I mean, actually, going back to Victorian times... Art schools used to specialise in the form of design that related most to local industry. Mm. So all the art schools in Stoke related to ceramics. Mm. All the art schools around Northampton designed shoes. And actually, maybe there's a lesson there mm. about, you know, not having a diffuse attitude towards industrial partnership, but actually relating it to the strengths of locality. It relates to what Anthony was mm -hmm. saying. And uh, so I don't think it's sort of unfair and crack of the whip and all those sort of arguments, mm. but it relates to it, regenerating regional I'm, industry. I am, Anthony. I am going to... Um, pick up on what Ron was saying, what about delight? I think it is very, very dangerous if we start instrumentalising everything. Uh, I think it's very, very important to realise that imaginative furniture is as important as furniture furniture. And indeed, how, how, we, how we value the change in our environment that something that has no function whatsoever uh, does to people's minds and spirits. What you do also is you, you, you bring me on to your new work, because I wanted to talk about that in the uh, uh, White Cube, which is um, the, biggest, the biggest piece you've made. No, I mean, no, it's, it's the, the biggest, it's the biggest body. body. It's the first body that I've made that you can actually get inside. You have to, go through. You have to go through its left foot, um, and only, there's only really room for one person at a time. Um, but the but the the show is called Model, and I wanted to really think about what that meant. Um, I think there's a there's a sense in which the model is an ideal. You're 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 aspiring to an ideal, but it's also in a way about a proposition about a possible. And so, it is to in, your body. 
It, well, it doesn't really matter whose body it is. They, I, I, in, for most of these works, I did. I, I was in the in the position that they are too, but they've been so evolved. I mean, basically, mm. it's using the language of architecture, which is normally what shelters the body, to describe its inner state or attempt to model its inner state. And the big work, which is a hundred tons of Corten steel, is twenty-four interconnecting chambers that make this reclining body uh, with that have more or less light. And you have to modify your body as you go through it because there are, there are chambers that are very mm. small and quite low and others that are extremely high. There are only three that allow light in. And I think this is about, in a, in a sense, experiencing the darkness of the body, which is, I think, the place that we all live and most of us spend most of our lives escaping from as a personal narrative. And th th this is the opposite of, uh, I suppose, mm. sculpture as the making of an object. It's sculpture as the making of a place. Because you're going to be drawing people inside the sculpture, then, as you say, relatively few are going to be able to be there at any one time. So, it, in a sense, it's the opposite of the public artwork sitting there surrounded by crowds of people. Well, I'm quite interested, Andrew, as to... I've, I've said that there are going to be no rules to this. There is room for, I, I, I think, about 380 people inside this body. But when it's full, it's going to be a very different sculpture. When it's empty, mm. as you walk through it, it's incredibly acoustically alive. It, it booms as you walk... And it's rather scary. And actually, um, they, they were wondering about what the justified form of invigilation should be and what the, uh, you know, what, what, what the fire uh, escape... What um, happens person, when somebody per, panics inside And what it. happens when somebody gets stuck in the, left, in, the left, in the left hand, which is actually only about 80 centimetres high and about um, four and a half metres long and very, very black. Um, and maybe somebody will go into the head, which is a complete light-locked black space um, and can't find their way out. Um, but all of these things are to be discovered. So this, this is a, um, a labyrinth of experience. Yes, uh, generalising from that, you know, Ruskin uh, gave a, a wonderful lecture called The Two Paths uh, in the, I think, the 1870s, where he talked about the roots of art education being the head, the heart and the hand. And that, you see, it's a good link, isn't it? What do you think, oh, Anthony? Yeah, very good. And, well, um, uh, and that, you know, the head period is all the think work that the Victorians did, and they certainly did a lot of thinking about design. The hand thing is about craft, mm. and the heart is having your finger on the pulse of contemporary culture, but also personal expression. And Ruskin argued the best kind of art education brings those three things together mm. the head, the heart, and the hand. Thus, we bring out the whole person. And I think, you know, there'd be moments in the history of art education where one or other of those things has been overbalanced. Too much head work in Victorian times, too much handwork in the arts and crafts period, and the heart really letting rip in all sorts of ways since the 1950s. A balance between those three concepts is, Very I think, the future of art education. And how does that relate, Ron, Arad, when you're, when you're thinking about a piece, when you're drawing a piece... Um, and you don't know whether this is going to be a piece for um, mass consumption, which is going to be made and sold in shops, or whether it's going you to be... You do know. You do know. Right from the beginning, you said this is going to be a yeah, one-off I mean, art piece. I mean, it's not, it's not one or the other. It's sometimes this yeah. and sometimes that. When you design for the industry, you have different things to consider, like the cost of production, the, te the technology, mm -hmm. the, the commercial side of it. Nothing wrong with that. And when, when you design a medical equipment, you have to know how it's going to be used in the best possible way. I mean, you do something that's for... Spectacles. Let's, let's talk about spectacles, because that's a very interesting one. Right. Uh, spectacles. So, uh, so you approach spectacles and you ask some very, very basic questions about spectacles. You look at it. First of all, for me to design is to do something that did not exist before I designed it. And you look at spectacles and everything is done and... And the whole industry is based on retro of retro. What new can we do? And you look and say, oh, why don't we do something that it's easy to to change the distance between the lenses? Because we all have different noses, different uh, mm -hmm. distance between the eyes. Easy. Why hasn't was why wasn't it done before? Another thing is, if you go to a, to a place where they make spectacles, it's like it's made by slaves basically people that put white gowns every morning and just mm. deal with little fiddly screws, why not make using techno using uh, SL selective, selective laser sintering, which is mm. 
mm. a form of printing objects why not make why not free the slaves <laughs> and do a uh, spectacles that are, are one piece no parts and we can do it with the geometry with the materials and it's not to be shown in an art gallery it's to, to be, be worn on your nose yeah yeah and yeah it's not to say that we can't use the same knowledge the same technology the same sort of skills to create delight in in so, different circumstances so, so we come to the oddness um sarah again of of, of colleges so that I, uh, lateral thinking is a stale phrase but fresh thinking um the ability to think think sideways mm -hmm. and, and 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 freshly um is what you want out of art colleges and you, and yet um the notion of a college the pedagogic notion of a college and that seems to be in contradiction to that i i would I beg to disagree on that one. In fact, I, I wouldn't beg to disagree. I will just disagree. Disagree um, away. Yes. Yeah. One of the things, when I was writing my essay for the um, our commemorative book, I, t I spoke with a number of colleagues. And one thing that came up over again was um, that we're not in the business of preparing students for industry. We're in the preparing them to create the future. We don't want them to fit into what's already there. We want, And I have a great quote from a colleague who says, we're not trying to usurp the mold. Rather, we're simply not considering it. Um, so I think, I mean, you're right, there is a tension, but it's that sort of magical tension of pushing forwards and complete rigour and challenge and why are you doing that um, that makes the school. Christopher. Yeah, there's a, there's a, I, I agree about the, the tension, although it is a, a dynamic form of tension. David Hockney, when he graduated mm. from the Royal College in 1962, did a sort of bootleg version of his diploma. He stormed the printing presses and printed his own diploma, and on it he had a student being supported by the then-rector, Robin Darmin, who you mentioned, bumping his head on the royal coat of arms. And I've spoken to him about it, and basically that, he reckons, is the whole tension of a place like the Royal College. Yes, there's the establishment bit, the lion and unicorn, the royal coat of arms, royal degrees, all that paraphernalia, but you bump your head on it. That's the point. That tension is what defines the college. That for him, uh, art education, that the cardinal sin in art education is not having a strong point of view. If you agree with everything and the system is like sponge and goes in all the time, then you get nowhere. What you want is a collision between generations and that's how you find your own voice. Final thought from Anthony Gormley. My feeling is that art schools are the things that reinforce agency in the world. A good art student thinks that he doesn't have to fit into an already existing world. He makes his own and that's what they're for. What a wonderful way to end what's been a wonderful conversation. Thanks to all of you, the designer and architect, Ron Arad. Sir Christopher Frayling, whose latest book it was on craftsmanship, published last year, but he's also co-curated the current Hollywood costume show, which is wowing them at the V&A. Sarah Teasley, whose essay is included in the book A Perfect Place to Grow, 175 Years at the RCA, and which accompanies an exhibition of the same name at the Royal College of Art. And Anthony Gormley, whose latest solo exhibition, Model, we were just talking about, is, will be showing at the White Cube uh, Gallery in Bermondsey in London from next Wednesday. Next week, we're going to be talking about Germany in Europe with Katinka Barish, Gisela Stewart, Douglas Carswell and Karen Leder. But for now, thank you and goodbye. There are many more Radio 4 arts and discussion programmes to download for free. Find these on the website at bbc.co.uk slash radio 4.